Uh, welcome back. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to um, moderate a panel of such luminaries. I should say my intentions are to moderate their time, but to instigate their discussion afterwards. So each panel will go for around 10 minutes. Let me give a quick uh, introduction. We'll, we'll go in the order in which people are sitting from your left to uh, your right. Uh, Raja Mohan is the, the head and uh, a research fellow of the Observer Researcher Foundation in New Delhi. He's a former professor at both JNU and NTU, and uh, he's currently a visiting research professor at NUS's Institute of South Asian Studies. Next to him, Rodolfo Severino uh, is the former Secretary General of ASEAN and is the head of the ASEAN Studies Center at the Institute for South Asian Studies at NUS. Um, Yoshihide Tsuriya is a professor of political science and international relations at the Faculty of Law of Keio University and is their director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. Next to him is Ethel Solingen, who is the Tierney Chair in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of California at Irvine and the former president of the International Studies Association. And immediately to my right is Zhu Fan, um, who is the director of the Center for Collaborative Studies of the South China Sea at Nanjing University. So we'll start with uh, Professor Mohan. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'd like to be part of this panel. Uh, since the subject is Asia, and uh, it's being done under the auspicious of the Japanese Studies Department, uh, it's not uh, uh, easy to forget a man called Okakura Tenshi, who talked about Asia. Uh, and he wrote this book called Ideas of the East, you know, it's free and on the net now, anybody can read it. It begins with a very nice sentence, and just one three letter, three word sentence, it says Asia is one. Asia is one, I mean, that's the opening sentence uh, of uh, Okakura's book. And then of course he goes to explain why and how Asia despite its seeming differences, uh, is actually uh, you know, in search for the ultimate and the universal. And in that respect, it differs from the West, which is focused on the particular and the, and the immediate, while Asia, where the China or Indian civilization think very differently, and there's something that binds them. Uh, so both two big ideas, you know, I think, uh, in uh, Okakura's book, that look, there is an idea of Asian unity, and that it is different from the West. Both these ideas, I think, in, in many ways, continue to play out today. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's agreement on these issues. So the fact is, how Asia relates to itself, how it thinks about itself, and how it, how it sees the West, say US in a more specifically today, uh, are issues, and I think sorting out these issues are going to be the key to the topic that we have for discussion today, which is how do you deal with the challenges and how do you uh, seize, the, seize the opportunities? Uh, so what I want to do is really to make three, three, three sets of points. One on the elusiveness uh, of the persistent fascination by the elusiveness uh, of the idea of Asian unity. Uh, then look at the importance of the continuing role of the West in shaping the future of Asia. And then look at, uh, is there a way that the Asia can cope with the uh, emerging dynamic between America and China? The nature of the relationship. And lastly, probably concluding thought on what India can do or what role can India play uh, in this new dynamic uh, that, is, that is emerging uh, in, uh, in Asia. So the first point, uh, I think the, uh, it was uh, almost 110 years ago that the book Asia, you know, Ideals of the East was published. Uh, since then, the idea of uh, Asian unity uh, has been an enduring one and uh, constantly subject to political manipulation that uh, Ian Guruma talked about in the morning as recently as two months ago. Uh, Xi Jinping was talking about Asia for Asians. I mean, that that uh, idea that locations can organize their own security is a notion that, that goes back uh, to the interwar period. But persistently it's been found it's impossible to achieve that, that goal because uh, the divisions in the, in the region are deep and are fundamental. Uh, they related, for example, you go back to the Second World War. We thought most of Asia was colonized, but they would be fighting the colonial uh, empires together. But as you found different peoples were fighting different colonial powers. Some were fighting the Japanese, some were fighting the uh, British, some were fighting the French. So it was not possible even at the height of a, a single big idea of anti-colonialism. Even that could not unite uh, Asia. And subsequently, you still had problems how to organize the, the post-war structures. 
And the, it's only in the last 20 years that we've seen Asia move towards some kind of integration. Some kind of but even that harmony seems to be breaking down today. And I think the problem of, of how do you deal with the new dynamic in Asia amidst the, the new tensions that have emerged uh, is going to be uh, a, a, an important issue. And I think this is not just about uh, changing the power distribution. It's also about creating new institutions, creating new norms. And it also seems that some of the existing rules uh, are going to be overthrown in the way Asia is dealing with them today. For example, the law of the sea. Uh, you would think that's an accepted notion, but today uh, the law of the sea itself is contested in multiple ways, at precisely at a time when Asia's waters have become uh, the artery of global commerce. You have significant contestation on what uh, this means and how that law of the sea can be, can be interpreted. The second, second set of points I wanted to make was on the, on the role of the United States. Uh, I think the last few years, and I think quite a bit of it has come from Singapore, uh, the triumphalism of Asian triumphalism, uh, why Asia is great and the best is finished, and you know, that, that kind of an argument that had grown in the last many years, because realists never bought that set of arguments. But I think despite the growth and significant expansion of Asia's power in the international system, uh, I think uh, the best is going to be very significant. The ideas, the innovations that are going to come from the West are going to make a difference to how Asia is going to organize itself. And I think the US, I mean, more directly in the security domain, despite its relative decline, what the US does and what the US does not do will have a significant bearing on how the Asian security institutions are going to emerge. And I think the challenge is going to be a, a, a big one. But the problem, I think, uh, is one of the American ambivalence. How does America see herself, and what kind of a role does it play? Uh, that I think uh, is going to be the problem. Uh, Guru again, I think talked about the ambivalences of late imperialism. I mean, do you persist despite weakness, or do you cut your losses and move out? But that argument, I think, within the U.S. continues, and what the role that the U.S. plays uh, here uh, is going to be is uncertain, unpredictable at this point in time. Uh, and I think in the near term, of course, the U.S. will remain a power of here. But I think over the longer term, uh, the, the fundamental dynamic, I think, China's growing power uh, is going to call into question the very essence, uh, essential elements of American strategy. That is the tension between China's growing military power, American power military presence, the Chinese quest to sanitize their neighborhood to American alliances. These tensions are fundamental. I mean, you don't have to blame one person on the other side for these tensions, but this is the structure of me. Rise of the Chinese power is going to create complications for the way the US has organized itself in Asia for so long. So I think how that goes to play out, I think, is the, is the important point. Third point that brings me uh, is, the, uh, is the question of uh, what, are the, what does rest of Asia do? It's quite clear uh, that the US China relationship is the principal defining feature of Asian relations. A lot of us don't like it, but you can lump it. But the fact is, uh, the US is the, the dominant power for so long, China is a rising power, and what they do with each other uh, is going to be the significant one. And I think the range is in which the range in which the, this relationship could, could oscillate. It could be Cold War on the one side, it could be condominium on the other. Uh, it could be concert of power, they could work together with other powers. They could talk about spheres of influence. They could talk about a G2, they could talk about telecom security. So many of these options are open. So it is not as if there is only one outcome that, that will come out of the US-China relationship. It depends on the relative strengths, the political preferences, and a whole range of other things. So if the, the fundamental structure of Asia is going to be defined by these two powers and the nature of the relationship, what should best of us do in Asia? Well, my view is that I think, uh, even during the Cold War between Americans and the Russians, the rest of Asia did not accept the logic of the that they were not going to let their political freedom be defined by what they do great powers. So that is, Asia never uh, fully uh, abided by the Cold War logic of the kind that existed in Europe. Many countries sought an independent role or distanced themselves. It was called non-alignment. Or some people aligned, some people disaligned. I mean, you, you had a, a shifting uh, range of policies that were, that were available. I think similarly in the case of, I think, in US-China, Asia is much stronger today in a sense that much, the countries that are a large number of large countries, India, Indonesia, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Philippines, every one of them is a fairly large country. And they're not going to simply 
accept the outcomes of US-China relationship. So my proposition is that, look, that is, it is important for these countries to work together on food. Not as a counter to the alliance with the United States, uh, as a counter to existing alliances, not as a counter to China. That is the only way Asia can secure itself against the unpredictability of the US-China relationship is to do more with each other. And I call it the coalition of the middle powers, that the middle powers of Asia must do more with each other, both as an insurance against what might happen, what happened in the United States, what China might do, that they need to construct a framework that does not merely rely on the hopes for collective security, or the desire for a normal relationship between US and China. That is, the only way to hedge against this is by increasing cooperation between themselves. And I think that's where I think the role of India comes in, that's my last point, uh, which is essentially, uh, India, India, until recently, most people thought we were not even part of Asia. But of course, uh, anybody with a bit, bit of history, when I mean, you go back, uh, it was the Indian Army that uh, pushed the Japanese out of Asia, it was not the American Army. Uh, it was the, uh, impact of the Indian presence, I mean, I think you can go back to opium wars, uh, whether it was the shaping of uh, regional security, whether it was the economic globalization of Asia, it was a British Raj, uh, and the resources of India that produced significant outcomes, because in India we don't want to talk about, it's politically incorrect to talk about this history, but the fact is that India was quite central to how modern Asia emerged. And I think India then opted out, willing to cut itself off, and came down upon itself. But today in India, that grows and becomes stronger, economically globalizing and building a stronger military, I think would have a significant role to play. And I think the debate about Asia and its future will be complicated, I think, by the rise of India and the emergence of India as a major economy, as a major military force. And that, I think, India has an opportunity once again to lead or to shape outcomes, essentially not by posing as anti-American, as we've done often, or pretending to be brothers with the Chinese, which is also a posture to one of actually finding pragmatic solutions, building more cooperation among the middle powers to construct alternatives to being left at the mercy of U.S. China relationship. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Sarino. I wish, first of all, to thank the organizers of this forum for inviting me to speak at this panel and especially to, for the opportunity to listen to Ian Buruma, who among other, other advantages tied up domestic policy politics with foreign policy decisions. Which brings me to what else but the experience of ASEAN. As 2015 approaches, more and more people, particularly the business leaders in Southeast Asia, increasingly ask me what will happen in 2015, more specifically in East Asia, especially the ASEAN economic community. The ASEAN, ASEAN community was decreed to be established in, at the end of 2015, according to the leaders of ASEAN. And here, which brings me in turn to the ICES ADB Asian Development Bank project to assess the prospects of the ASEAN economic community economic because the ADB doesn't want to touch anything political. And here, the ICES and the ADB turned around and asked several experts to produce a book called The ASEAN Economic Community 2015, A Work in Progress. It is indeed a work in progress, and their conclusion was that if one takes 
the blueprint for an ASEAN economic community, literally, then Southeast Asia is far from being economically integrated. And that, and one, although one must prescind from what causes this lack of integration, is that domestic politics is the main obstacle to economic integration. So why talk about integration at all? And why talk about the community at all? much less in 2015. One must bear in mind that peace and stability and a sense of regional identity, the prerequisites for ASEAN integration will happen only if there is economic cohesion among the members of the Southeast Asian nations, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And why must they integrate? It is to capture the foreign direct investment that has been, that had been lost to China and India, which means, which would have meant more jobs, higher incomes, greater competition and productivity, and more choices for consumers and workers. So again, there is this political imperative for economic integration that takes place, that is supposed to take place by 2015. But it is not as if ASEAN will change its character or ways of doing things just because 2015 is here. But it's a benchmark to measure the progress of where ASEAN has, has gone from its birth in 1967 to today. It is a measure of, the, of how far the association has gone in integrating its economy and in preserving the peace and stability of the region. So we tend to agree with Ian Buruma's conclusion that domestic politics is tied up with foreign policy decisions even if that was not the intention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Professor Saia. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hoff. And uh, I also would like to thank particularly Professor Natano for inviting me and, uh, and Professor Maya Ole for, for guiding this entire program. Uh, it's, it's always such a pleasure to, to come back to Singapore and Southeast Asia. And uh, just listening to uh, Roger Mafan's uh, remarks and, and the, the concluding points, uh, I, I, I was thinking if you would replace the term India with Japan, my arguments are very similar. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, or is it, I have a plan to go to Delhi next, next week. And you're going to take part in the Observer Foundation. Yeah. But, but I had to cancel it because I didn't have time to apply for visa and get it. And in order for me to do this, I had to cancel this trip to Singapore. So I, I had a hard choice. It's not <laughs> between Singapore and Delhi. And I, I chose this. I'm sorry. So uh, I hope you <laughs> convey my points to that conference. Uh, and uh, I, I have a firm belief in. Uh, so some of the Congress uh, between our central points. And ASEAN is very important, sitting just in between, uh, in, uh, in, uh, involving us in this multilateral context. Uh, 
and the U.S. is important in between Japan and China. And uh, I think organizers have a very strategic <laughs> concept regarding how to see this. But anyway, uh, my, my, well, uh, some serious joke, joke aside, uh, let me uh, place uh, the major theme of Dr. Guruma's uh, keynote uh, address, which is uh, territorial dispute, particularly between Japan and China in this context, in a somewhat uh, longer term perspective and a macro uh, context. Uh, I think this is not, not simply a territorial dispute in the traditional sense. I think implications are much, much deeper uh, uh, in terms of sort of you know, transforming regional orders and the nature of the rise of China and the eventual sort of order which we will see in this region. And uh, uh, in talking about the rise of China, uh, let me try to, I'm not a China specialist, but very, so very broadly uh, try to decipher the concept of a so-called a new model of uh, major power relations, which uh, many Chinese leaders and scholars uh, like to talk about. And I think the essence of this concept is somewhat explicit in the words of Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, who said reportedly in Washington, and maybe somewhere else, uh, to the effect that Asia-Pacific is wide enough to accommodate both the United States and China. And uh, I think here, uh, basically, uh, as, as uh, implied and discussed in, in, in the morning session, uh, I think China essentially want U.S. out and, um, from, 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 from Asia. And but of course, this is essentially a very conception. In reality, of course, it, it may not happen anytime soon. And that's why and how this sort of strategic rivalry between Japan, uh, sorry, China and the United States will continue to be a key determinant, as uh, again, uh, Raja uh, talked about. And, but but uh, so, so this is, I, I, I tend to see this uh, sort of urge coming from China more of a psychology rather than a kind of well thought out strategy. And this psychology has a lot to do with, uh, of course, Chinese so-called nationalism. Again, this is a big theme, but uh, for the lack of time, uh, allow me to be just simplistic. Uh, I think this uh, Chinese nationalism is, is a unique combination of sense of humiliation, coming from how Chinese people perceive history since the Opium War, on the one hand, and a kind of uh, 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 sense of pride uh, arising from the recent spectacular rise. So, so sense of humiliation and pride, I think, makes up a unique uh, sort of Chinese uh, psychology, uh, which is, I think, uh, equal to more or less nationalism. And territorial dispute, uh, to me, is, is, is important for the Chinese people in this particular psychology, because uh, their premise is that the islands, particularly in this case, I mean, both South China Sea Islands, as well as the Senkaku between Japan and China, uh, have been there since ancient times, so-called ancient times. And in, in the Shangri-La dialogue, uh, Chinese uh, a military uh, representative talks about the Han Dynasty, 2,000 year a history of Chinese claim to these islands. And uh, so in a way, kind of recovering you know, the, the, the sovereignty uh, over those islands is in a way, I think, doing justice to history from Chinese perspective. And here, the sense of history, humiliation is very important, I think, uh, that China has been victimized by the Western powers and so forth. So, so, so recovering sovereignty over those uh, islands, and the, in terms of Senkaku, maybe lost uh, uh, islands, uh, I think is, is almost equal to doing justice in the particular Chinese psychology and nationalism. And I think this is the most difficult aspect of dealing with China for us, because, as I said, this is simply beyond kind of rational calculation of your uh, strategic you know, thinking, let alone a military uh, strategy. And, and allow me to talk a little bit about Japanese position on this. Uh, I'd like to uh, say this not in the way of insisting uh, our, our case, but the intention is to contrast the difference between Chinese uh, sort of belief in this and Japanese uh, position on this. And uh, the Japanese positions are basically legal, very much legal. 
And uh, the distinction between January 1895 and April 1895 is very important. And January 1895 is the time when the Meiji government made the decision to incorporate Senkaku into Japanese territory, which is in the process of ending the Sino-Japanese War. Therefore, for the Chinese, uh, Sino-Japanese War being a, one of those cases, earlier cases of hu being humiliated, of course, for the Chinese mind, there should be no difference between January and April. It's one set of humiliating experiences. But from Japanese point of view, this difference is very important uh, because, first of all, Japan gave up all the territories which we gained as a result of the uh, Sino-Japanese War, which is after Shimonoseki Treaty, which was signed in April 1985. Therefore, incorporation of Senkaku years is beyond this legal framework of accepting uh, Potsdam Declaration and then the Cairo Declaration uh, because of this uh, Article 8 of the Potsdam Declaration. So this is a legal argument, legal argument. So in order for Japanese case to be evade, uh, there, there should be two things. One is uh, the legitimacy of the difference between January and April. And second, secondly, maybe macro nature of the Sino-Japanese war, which is for Chinese, is a humiliating experience. But to be frank, for the Japanese, one of the kind of normal wars uh, during those period uh, in, in the history of modern international politics. And I think uh, maybe ICJ can, only ICJ can make the final judgment as to, as to the legality of these. So, so uh, to make a case for, for Jap Japan is not my intention, as I said. Here, the intention is to make a contrast between Chinese sort of uh, psychology uh, behind this issue. Islands being there since ancient times. Therefore, sovereignty should belong to them. And Japanese insistence on the legitimacy of the modern international law and politics. So this is a, a virtual paradigm clash between Chinese and Japanese way of looking at evolution of uh, regional orders uh, in the modern history. And I think that's, that's how and why this is very difficult. And then what, what could be done? So, so that's, that's my sort of concluding moment. Two things. Well, uh, needless to say, it takes a long-term process and perspective. There is no easy solution. I don't think China, China also has a very long-term kind of perspective in dealing with this issue. I don't think China is going to take points and sinker by force anytime soon. They are not foolish enough to do that. US is there, US Japan Alliance is there. Washington has said repeatedly that even though they don't take sides in terms of sovereignty disputes, if China use military force against Senkaku, US is going to be involved because Iran has been in Japan's administrative control. Uh, not, not since 1945, but since 1895, for 120 years. And at one point, there were about 200 Japanese living on the islands and doing fishing and, and so forth. But they ran out of business and they evacuated the islands. So, so given those kind of uh, history, uh, I think US commitment uh, of defending Senkaku uh, should be taken seriously by the Chinese, and, and they do. So, so hypothetically, again, theoretically, if China ever succeeds in taking the islands, that would be the time when US would not be involved. So that, that is a virtual realization of Chinese, I think, uh, dream of establishing new type of great power relations, perhaps. US is out and would not intervene in Chinese affairs in Asia. And, uh, but, but again, in reality, that is not going to happen. But I think that aspect is very, very deeply structurally rooted in this uh, island uh, disputes between Japan and China. Therefore, we do need to take a long-term perspective. There is no easy uh, short-term solution, so-called solution to this. Then what can be done, or should be done in, in, in long term? Uh, and the, uh, I'd like to say two things. And one of them is exactly what Raja said. Cooperation among East Asian countries is very important. And, uh, and here, I, I also agree that this is not ganging up against China. And uh, this is not ganging up against either US. And in this regional cooperation, 
I've been arguing for Japan's middle power strategy, in fact. So I was somewhat pleasantly surprised when Raja talked about middle power, and he sounded as if you included uh, India uh, in, in the group of middle powers. And, uh, and I've been making the same argument as to Japan. And the point is not whether Japan is a middle power or great power. It, it's about strategy, you know, middle power strategy. And uh, so, so along that line of thinking, I mean, cooperation among middle power, so East Asia countries is very important. And here there are two stages, as far as I'm concerned. One stage is East Asia countries should talk among themselves without the US and China. They are supposed to own small universities uh, on their own rights, but we are not, we are not. And so we should be able to talk about the implications of the rise of China, the future US security role, and so forth, in a common perspective and in a common language. That's a very important endeavor which East Asian countries have to do together. And I think Japan should be there. Japan should be involved in there. And uh, again, this is not campaign against China. But, but China will certainly take it as such for, for some time to come. But which is uh, unavoidable. So we have to be persistent and patient. But eventually, these East Asian endeavors have to have some, some way of talking to the Chinese because China is here. China is a big entity. And without, without you know, living with China happily and prosperously, there should be no stable you know, secure order in Asia. And so eventually, we have to be able to talk about China, talk with China. Uh, but before doing that, we, we have to be able to talk among ourselves. So, 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 so the strategic merits and goal, even goals of this, what I used to call middle power cooperation among East Asian countries, is first of all to survive the time of the rise of China. We cannot survive this by single country. We have to cooperate. But eventually, we have to coexist with China. I think eventual coexistence with China is the ultimate goal for this East Asian cooperation. Therefore, eventually talking with the Chinese is going to be very important. And in order to, for us to do that, I think to be frank, China has to change. I hope China will change. And there are hope such as Japan. And there, there are liberal internationalists in China. And we should be able to talk to them you know, about this common order eventually. And hopefully, liberal internationalists in China will start. I have a picture of Tiananmen incident, a single young man you know, stopping the tank with his hands. That, that, that's, that's my picture. Chinese people standing in front of the Chinese PLA, and, uh, or, or whoever uh, would be adventurous. And, um, and uh, so, so engaging Chinese civil society is already an important I think, project today. And uh, I have some critical points about Japanese approach from, from this point of view, but, uh, but because I uh, was brought here partially with Japanese money, I would not say that. So I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, Tao? Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizers and uh, to Ted and to the participants for very stimulating presentations. What I'd like to do is to address the key questions that we were posed to us uh, in three acts, as in the theater. The main character in this play is China's charm offensive, but others play important roles as well. Act one. Once upon a time, there was a charm offensive. On the ashes of an autarkic um, model, Maoist model, Deng Xiaoping and his successors unleashed the internationalization of China's economy, leading to very impressive achievements. This grand strategy required a peaceful rise, a new matrix of regional relations, a, ch a charm offensive vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN states, a set of more mature political relations with Northeast Asian neighbors, and a new openness to multilateral and regional institutions. So from the perspective of the architects of the charm offensive, regional tensions and instability were anathema, a danger to China's rise, really. Instead, a stable environment at the level of the region, economic growth and domestic stability were synergistic, paving the road to a well-off society. Xiao Kanshen. Um, 
China and ASEAN, of course, signed the Joint Declaration on Strategic Partnership for Peace and Prosperity to coordinate foreign and security policy. China acceded to ASEAN's Treaty on Amity and Cooperation ahead of any other superpower. China and ASEAN agreed to resolve quarrels uh, concerning the South China Sea without the threat of use of force, and so on and so forth. You all know Act 1, so let me move to Act 2. Following this rather impressive Act 1, China's term offensive enters a difficult puberty. There is more aggressive vigilance over territorial disputes by most East Asian states, not just China. Overlapping air identification zones compete heavily with restraint and mature diplomacy. More unilateralism and exclusionary regional institutions, exclusionary regional institutions compete with agreed codes of conduct on the South China Sea, with open regionalism, the typical feature of uh, uh, East Asian institutions and so on. Provocations sometimes reach risky levels around the Diao use and Kaku, Spratlys, Paracels, and so on. China uses economic coercion vis-a-vis -vis Japan on rare earths and on the Philippines, and some Japanese leaders engage in behavior that is utterly insensitive to others' grievances, such as visits to Yasukuni. There is hyper-nationalist revisionism of war crimes, uh, which are nothing, war crimes that are nothing less than historical facts, as we heard this morning. There's vigorous military modernization all around that acquires more offensive overtones and competes with societal needs everywhere. China's military expenditures, to take one example, which had lagged after GDP, uh, uh, military expenses, expenditures had lagged after GDP growth in Act 1, now are surpassing, in Act 2, are surpassing GDP growth in 2006, 2009, and 2012. And this is a very large GDP, as you know. Negative views of China rise in South Korea from 58% in 2005 to 76% in 2011 after China sides with North Korea on the Chongan and, and Yongpyeong incidents. 90%, 94% of South Koreans believed at this point that the US would be the greatest force for peace in 10 years. But only 6% feel that China would play that role. That's not very common in South Korean public opinion, as many of you know. Uh, a 2013 Pew survey finds that strong majorities in the Philippines, over 90%, and so on, Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia, thought that territorial disputes with China were a big problem for their country, and that China's military expenditures were bad for their country. A poll this year, Pew poll, found majorities in eight of 11 Asian countries to be worried that China's territorial ambitions could lead to military conflict with neighbors, and so on and so forth. And in China itself, this is very important, in China itself, 62% were concerned with a possible conflict. So what changed between Acts 1 and 2? The transition reflects stress in the charm offensive from two sources, I would argue, a two-pronged pincer movement. One, indeed, stemming from domestic pressure, pressures, and I would trace them from pressures that stem from inward-looking constituencies that seek to challenge the goals of China's internationalizing camps. You mentioned the internationalization that came in handy. The other source of this um, uh, stress in the charm offensive is contagious diffusion. And here, yes, um, nationalism and sometimes hyper-nationalism is there, but sometimes uh, it, it's not a closed circuit. Uh, it, rather, I think of hyper-nationalism in one East, East Asian state, state strengthening hyper-nationalism in neighboring states in a spiral fa fashion. These are, these are the spiral fashions that indeed were prevalent uh, pre-World War I. All of these um, events that I just described enfeebled the charm offensive. Brinkmanship lowered barriers to military incidents of the kind that were all familiar, and indeed some people warned against 
in the World War I scenario. And an, an analogy that, in my view, is overstretched, but the point remains. Act two induces some panic that the many decades without war in East Asia, which in some of my work I labeled Pax Asiatica, not Pax Americana, but Pax Asiatica, that that absence of war could, it just could, come to an end. Act three. Now we're in, in Act three. There's little point in debating which side incurred greater damage from events in Act two. All sides did. Japan's FDI to China declined over 50% over the first half of 2014 relative to 2013. Japan's exports to China declined as well. Many high-tech products assembled and exported from China require Japanese parts, particularly in information and communications equipment. Everybody was in the domain of losses. And a global economic downturn loomed on the horizon. It still does. With the writing on the wall, it was time to act. President Xi Jinping deepened his control of the, the military and the security bureaucracies and signaled commitment to deepening internationalized, internationalizing reforms. Former Prime Minister Fukuda visited with Xi Jinping. Japanese and Chinese officials met each other in Qingdao, I believe, to discuss the state of Asia, China Sea. Before the handshake, there were quite a number of events uh, leading, leading to it already. Um, a confidant of President Xi uh, met Japanese officials. There were renewed later, uh, bilateral academic, business, and uh, even military meetings. Um, Chinese and Japanese prime ministers shook hands, and so on and so forth. President Xi declared that he hoped to advance long-term, stable, and amicable relations with Japan. Prime Minister Abe called for establishing a stable and friendly relationship with China during his policy speech in the Diet on September 29. I think that was the first. And last week, of course, we had the handshake and efforts to work on hotlines to prevent maritime clashes and the like. I want to just warn that Act 3 is just getting started, in my view. Nobody expects love affairs or harmony. Cooperation in international relations, we teach our students all the time, cooperation is not harmony. Cooperation requires mutual adjustment. Mutual, uh, mutual adjustment was also reflected in US-China agreements on the environment, security coordination, and tariff cuts for our technology products. Uh, there was also mutual adjustment in the conclusion of FTAs between China and Australia, presumably China and South Korea, APEC, APEC members' agreement to conduct a strategic study on the free trade area of the Asia Pacific by 2016, and other events of last week, all those suggest mutual, uh, uh, mutual adjustment, a very good thing. And all, all of this bodes well for the near future. We're likely to end, I believe and I hope, on a much better note than the preceding two years. But picking up from Act 1, to act three as if act two never happened is unfortunately not possible. For act three to restore the charm offensive of act one will require a lot more work on all sides. As President Xi expressed, and I quote, a pool begins with many drops of water. Hopefully many more drops can be added to those collected uh, this past week. Uh, and eventually we'll get to the pool. Thank you, Rotel. So we'll finish up with Professor Crane. Okay. Yeah, first of all, let me thank Solonizer to invite me here. So it's a great opportunity to uh, share the thoughts with uh, the distinguished panelists on the uh, East Asia security dynamic. I think uh, the East Asia security dynamic has never been more interesting for the time being. We can easily list that a couple of new factors. For example, the U.S. is pivoting back. It's not just uh, say some sort of the tactical uh, re-gesturing uh, of the American uh, military. Uh, it's some sort of we say uh, we shifted uh, strategic gravity uh, globally. So then we will see the China is deeply locked down. 
So then it seemed to me the pivoting nature is not just a say uh, as simple as how to respond to the Chinese military blowback and pivoting back Asia well signifying the future's global uh, strategy that the diplomatic and even military let's say gesture. Then secondly is Japan become a new factor uh, in regional security restructuring. So then uh, Abe just uh, came to the power less than two years since he uh, started off his uh, second they say a term of uh, uh, prime ministership. That's a province Japan is brand new. So that kind of Japan for China will have to reconsider and rethink how some sort of a pop response could be expected and uh, sorted out, not just the how they uh, always uh, pushing for some sort of crash. China, Japan, we need uh, some sort of uh, 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 rapprochement, we need a compromise because I think the China-Japan relations now is more likely to decide the future skyline of Asian Pacific security order. Yes, I think a lot of people believe or consume that, assume that, you know, the China-US will decide, you know, the skyline of Asian Pacific security. Rather, my view is quite different. I think the China-Japan is more likely. Because China-U.S. relations is a little bit, you know, uh, uh, fixed act uh, in some sort of uh, anticipation. We say uh, we experienced the uh, military crisis. We also uh, see such a power disparity remain steady. Whenever China is getting bigger, China is getting more assertive. We are taking a cutting edge. Such as things will never change. You know, come in two, three, or four decades. I think for that part, I don't think that China will see challenge the U.S. as uh, some sort of leading priority. Because we can't. We're also not able. The most important thing is we do not intend. The reason is, as the President Obama's plan complained, that China probably get a lot from free riding American supremacy. So my uh, uh, response is, uh, to be a free rider is the best strategic choice for China. That will be cheaper, less risky. So in the coming days, I think that China will continue to be some sort of, let's say, uh, free riders. I don't think there is anything way to derail this course. So we prefer to stay as some sort of, not completely uh, comfortable, but uh, uh, are more likely to be a free rider. Uh, on the American supremacy. Then, um, but the problem is, if we look at the China-Japan relations, it's a very special one. I'm a professor of international relations. My specialty is uh, international security studies. I have to say, there's no power relations in the today's world which will match Beijing-Tokyo relations as some sort of unbelievably vulnerable and we say a volatile, because we can easily sum up all the elements which will be responsible for the great power rivalries between Beijing and Tokyo. For example, your proximity and the security dilemma. Then we say mutually repentant, some sort of a social feeling, and then resolve the territorial disputes. Then even some sort of a power uh, typology, we are very, very contentious. Japan is a sea power, China has been long a land power. So both international relations theory and international history just tells us that kind of a power typology usually, you know, easily lead to some sort of a confrontation. So then my view is that China-Japan relations are more worrisome, more unpredictable than the China-US relations. So then, I think we need to pay more attention to Beijing Tokyo relations. Um, then the third one is ASEAN. ASEAN, ASEAN centrality. I think it is, uh, is, it is getting very, very explicitly and adequately respected across the region. The reason is not how capable ASEAN is. The reason is ASEAN centrality is big facilitator to keep the, you know, the power structure evolved. So then, um, 
I totally agree that ASEAN could, could play a bigger role. So then ASEAN, what kind of the, the, the mission you will show them, uh, and you will just uh, uh, carry on, I think will be another very interesting uh, determinant variable in the coming days. Then we will have a fourth one. The fourth one is also some sort of uh, stimulating domestic politics. Yes, if we always focus very narrowly on some sort of structure, structural effects, then I think that, that will be probably just offer us some sort of uh, misconstrued, the real source of the lingering tension in the region. I associate more my you know, the observation to some sort of very contentious domestic politics. Look at the US, look at the China, look at the Japan. They're almost the same. So the, 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 the deeply rooted factors to get those powers apart is not well-calculated national interest or some sort of a long plan, the new strategic goal. It's just because the all politics is local. China is in transition. So Xi Jinping very honestly tell the President Obama when they made last week in Beijing why he couldn't back off from territorial disputes. He made the point. He said, 1.4 billion people are watching me. I can't, I can't check it out. You can understand? Okay, then President Obama, of course, feel a little bit released or nervous. I don't know. Uh, anyway, domestic <coughs> politics, South China's issues, I don't think. The China will falling into the first print of the President Putin, then just uh, uh, causing something bad. I think the, the, the China, at the center of the China's policy of the South China Sea is China's domestic politics. Because so far, no China leader would like to risk, risk huge devastation to their personality, a personal popularity to back off. Some kind of jealous, almost the same. But always just uh, compare the Chinese to dispatch the you know, surveillance boats and coast guard boats patrolling at the territory war of the San Kaku Diaoyu Island issue. The reason is the Chinese leaders say 1.4 billion people are watching. We can't stand back. So then, my view is that. So far, most interesting challenge for policy community and scholar community about East Asia studies is how adequate we could be prescribing what is really matters, what is really wrong, what is really good. So my view is that currently we are facing some sort of a leading challenge. First is what kind of a paradigm we can rebuild to converge history, local politics, and the traditional international relations series. For example, you know the uh, uh, ambassador uh, Kisho Babubani, he's a great thinker in Singapore. He say the future's uh, world of politics resting on on what? On great convergence of the West and East. And so probably in his book is Little Echo. Quite a few people in the West believe Kishu made the point because they consider some sort of a power contestation between Washington and Beijing is absolutely ideological showdown. Before some sort of such a regime remain unchanged, that would be very dangerous. Because that means whatever China perform ourselves, then there's no way for the U.S. and the other Western powers to take the China as it is. But the problem is who will decide what kind of China is. It's not the American, it's not the Western power, it's the Chinese. So please, take the China as it is. I'm a liberal scholar, I'm very critical to the Chinese government. I have to say the reality is ongoing experiments in China is not that bad. China now is at the best of time in the past 400 years. We should respect this reality. Furthermore, 
China's rise coincides with the history of Asia. Whenever shown, the China could contribute a lot more to get the Asia into the new historical high. If the China is down, Asia will be down. That kind of a conviction now, it seems to me, make a lot of sense, a lot more sense. Then you also underscore some sort of cohesive element to boost the China ASEAN relations back. So that's my question. We can accept China as it is now. I think it's a big question for Chinese and for the rest of the world. The second, I think it's also very, very clear cut. That means we need to just uh, how to say, uh, get a little bit away from traditional realist, balanced power centric you know, approach. We need to look at some sort of the better of the people. For example, what really matters for most of Chinese? They want to live a better life. They want to have a lot of money. They want their world is also swollen. Yes, Xi Jinping sounds very rhetorical and vocal. But the problem is, I think that that kind of generation of Chinese leadership really want to show the world he's peaceful. He's just a panga like the Chinese leader. So now the risk is how aggressive or assertive he will be. The risk for me is Chinese leader can't help, help waiting longer to just put all things at the table and say, please take out as you want. Then we finish the all hands full of good cause. That probably will also just to get a Chinese contribution, you know, just a uh, uh, dropping down. So for that part, China, what's the China? China's lending power. China now is lending to be a great power. I don't want to say demonization or whatever it is. That's the problem is. Believe me, now 1.4 Chinese people, they prove to be more expected, more anticipated than Chinese leadership. Chinese society, open society, one party rule. Then we will see a lot of the Chinese foreign policy have to be through some sort of such a popular support from the people. That kind of China is positive. Last one is I think we also needed to see some sort of way a new approach to integrating the both. That means, for example, the history, geography, and economic integrations. East Asia is very peculiar. History is not old. Geopolitics is not old. Most important thing is ideology, ideology is not old. We need some sort of a new split over those lines, or we can just uh, how to say work out some sort of a new approach to get those you know uh, uh, gaps just uh, you know uh, narrowed on and the blood act. So my view is that so we need to just to develop some sort of a new diplomatic skill. We need also arming with some sort of a new thoughts then coming after some of the updates to almost a policy format and scholarly analytical framework. Thanks. All right, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my position here. I, I have a question for each one of you, a different question for each one of you. And uh, you need not answer because then we'll just turn it open to the floor and gather questions. So those of you armed with your microphones, please look for raised hands. Um, so. Um, Professor Mohan, my question for you is, uh, again, something that builds what other people have said, is um, you know, in, at the end of your remarks, you pointed out that India is uh, becoming militarily stronger. Uh, my question was, why bother? Why not just free ride on the United States, just like Zhu thinks that China should free ride on US supremacy? Why is it irrational for India to start uh, spending resources, which are, are not in very high supply in India, on trying to compete militarily with China, especially the Blue Water Navy idea. Uh, Ambassador Severino, I'd like you to put on your Philippine Foreign Ministry hat for a moment. Uh, the Chinese 
like to say that um, the U.S. is behind uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, and in some sense Japan in uh, asking uh, for U.S. help in balancing against uh, China's uh, conduct uh, over the disputes. I'm wondering whether you could shed some light on how much is there uh, a demand within the Philippines for greater American military support uh, with respect to China, and how much is the U.S. actually pushing the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam to ask for U.S. support? Uh, Professor Sui, I'm wondering if you could respond to Zhu's uh, suggestion earlier during Ian Baruma's talk um, about a nuclear Japan. Uh, as uh, Zhu pointed out, the security line between Japan and China is very acute. And as we've learned from Robert Jervis and others, nuclear weapons are the greatest possible solution to the security dilemma because it gives both sides secure defense. Uh, in which case, I wonder whether you'd like to speculate about whether nuclear Japan would be a, a good idea for the uh, region. Uh, Atel, does the U.S. have another Cold War in it? Uh, going back to Ian Baruma's speculation about uh, the, the ambivalent empire, does, does the U.S. have the political will to actually go through uh, another Cold War great power conflict? Or is the coast clear for China's rise? Which brings me to Zhu. I mean, um, in my, from my perspective, at least, China is pursuing the only grand strategy possible to get the U.S. back into the great power Cold War game. Um, I mean, the U.S. is tired, overextended, its population would like to come home, and what does China do? China engages in Act Two, which is like the only collection of behavior that can get the U.S. back into the game, such that local states um, are asking that the U.S. become more militarily involved. Uh, the only thing that could possibly bring U.S. domestic politics to any kind of consensus is a Cold War with China. I mean, right now, U.S. politics is completely split. Politics is broken. They can't pass a budget. But one thing they can agree on is to engage in great power games with China. So why isn't China's grand strategy self-defeating? And now I'll open it up to you all. Sir. Sir, one, two, three. Uh, Yong Wong from ANU. I have um, two comments uh, on the presentations, which um, I enjoyed very much. Uh, my first comment uh, is uh, about territory disputes. I do think it's a bit of a mistake to say that China has territory ambitions. I mean, empirically, China has settled a lot of it, uh, actually most of its land border disputes, uh, taking less than 50% in all those disputes, right? Uh, as uh, Taylor Frever at MIT has shown through his research. So I do think it's a bit of a mistake to speak of territory ambitions of China. Uh, at the same time, I also think it's a mistake to lump uh, the East China Sea disputes with South China Sea disputes. I think South China Sea disputes are not regarded as uh, part of the core interest of the Chinese government, He Xin Li Yi, whereas East China Sea does fall into this core interest of the uh, of Beijing. So, and also there is a greater sense of uh, historical injustice when it comes to East China Sea. I mean, you know, not the, not the same kind of uh, sense of historical injustice, humiliation exists in the case of South China Sea. And I also think the uh, this, you know, infamous 9 dash line can also be revised uh, in the future. There's a possibility of uh, this 9 dash line, uh, line being revised because we know that in the 60s and 50s, it used to be 11 dash line, right? and two lines were removed without any explanation by the Chinese government, and we don't know exactly the nature of the Chinese claim as yet, which all suggests that there's some room for diplomatic uh, 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 negotiation over the exact nature of the Chinese uh, territory claim in the South China Sea. My second uh, comment is about the, uh, the so-called middle power uh, cooperation, which Professor Mohan and uh, Soya uh, spoke about. I'm actually all for greater uh, interactions uh, uh, between other East Asian countries, you know, it'll be a, it'll be a sort of sad uh, for the rest of the region if the future architect of region gets decided by uh, only China and USA. So I'm all for this, but I'm actually pessimistic whether this can be done uh, for two reasons. First, these middle powers themselves have their own disputes between themselves, right? So uh, and and those disputes, some of those disputes are as serious as the great power rivalry between China and the USA, or the disputes that exist between these regional countries 
and China. So that's one uh, reason why I'm pessimistic. Uh, more importantly, my second reason that I'm pessimistic about this uh, middle power cooperation or middle power diplomacy is that these middle powers or most of these middle powers are either US allies or pro-USA. And as such, they cannot really take a neutral position when it comes to China. Right? And I think for middle power diplomacy to work, you should be uh, uh, at least prepared to convince not just the Chinese leadership but also American leadership as to how America should respond to the rise of China. I have not seen uh, any effort made by uh, the so-called middle powers in trying to reach out to the USA and convince the American leadership that you know, there's a certain way that American leadership should approach uh, China, the Chinese leadership, and the accommodated rise of China. That's why I'm a little bit pessimistic about this. I mean, if you want to uh, uh, comment on my comments, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Let's collect a couple more questions. Back there. In the back. Uh, hi. Uh, Ian Chong, I uh, teach at NUS. So, um, actually, Mike, I'm hoping that most of the uh, panelists can comment uh, on this in one way or another to sort of piggyback on the earlier sets of comments. Uh, you know, looking at middle powers and also uh, perhaps Southeast Asia, India, uh, intra-Southeast Asia cooperation. Why, why do uh, people who sort of promote the idea of these sorts of cooperation not, um, I'm curious as to, you know, how you would sort of take into consideration the collective action problems that will be very severe with lots of actors, lots of different interests. Um, and what we have seen arguably with ASEAN uh, uh, in recent years is the fact that you have the divergent interests have prevented more effective cooperation. So why would we not expect this uh, when we sort of expand the number of actors who we think should be working together? Yeah. One more? Yeah. Can you bring it? Tan King Sui, ex War College, Singapore. Well, ask my question on Professor Raja Moran. Not what you have just said, but what you should have said and didn't say. China is containing India, and India is aware of it. It's a huge army. The string of pearls, and then one see the Chinese have uh, the ships there. It's trying to use the Pakistan ship, of India. Also, was trying to use uh, uh, Burma. Like, also trying. To, to, to watch India from Sri Lanka for a very long time. And when India is aware of it, it's also trying to go to the uh, uh, South Pacific, this is India and all that. But India knows that the whole of Europe is not interested in this area. Can you comment on this? And then another question is about it to uh, His Excellency Severino. You talk about ASEAN and then the AEC, ASEAN Economic Community. There's a lot of talk here, a lot of newspapers here on. ASEAN, ASEAN, ASEAN uh, committee. But you go north, in the Mekong uh, river countries, they go, oh, it's ASEAN. Oh, yeah, me, you yeah, me, guy, and one, you just talk. It's just a big talk shop. It's an ASEAN corporation. You want to take something, export or import, from the you know, China countries, to Vietnam, or to, 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 uh, to, to uh, 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 what do you call it, Thailand. There are a lot of things you go through. You take French books. Oh, you must go to the Lake of Forest Park. That's the same old thing in my case. Is that asking cooperation? You can ask for all the time. They don't care. This one big box shop, that's all there is. They comment on that too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot on the plate. You might as well just start at the end and walk, work your way forward. Thanks. I think uh, on the question of uh, why does India spend money on, on, on defense, I mean, possibly three, three explanations. I, mean, I think. Uh, one is the stupidity that comes out of great power ambitions. <laughs> uh, that uh, you go back to the 50s and India started its space program, nuclear program. I said, look, you guys are crazy. I mean, why do you want to do when you don't have anything to eat? I mean, why are you trying to do rockets? But today, of course, India has the cheapest mass mission and all that. Claim that India still is launching commercial rockets. It's kind of dying out in most parts of the uh, US. So I think. Uh, big countries make big mistakes, they also make big gambles, so I think what China does, what India does, a lot of it can be justified on the basis. But the fact is, uh, Norway is not going to have a space program, but India will have a space program. So it is not a question of resource allocation problem, it is the, your sense of identity and what your aspirations in the global state are. 
The second uh, issue is that look, it is it is a it's a question of prudence. Uh, we love free riding as much as the Chinese do. Uh, that uh, you quite happy to have the American ministries to say Americans get out of the Indian Ocean. Now we say please stay as long as you can. Uh, stay in Afghanistan another 10 years, please. Uh, if you can take care of the problem in Afghanistan, if you can take care of Gulf security. So, but it is a question of what if the U.S. doesn't? That is a problem. And the problem is what if the U.S. cuts a deal with, with China and says, look, let's run out the condominium. I mean, I think I'm just saying that. Uh, when the Americans keep telling us, look, China, U.S. relationship, no, we want to manage climate change, we want to manage global order. We say, look, just, just maybe, just you've got to hedge against their cooperation as well as well as against their, their confrontation. So you've got to take some into The last explanation is, look, uh, it happens without much effort. That is, both China and India spending less than 2% of the GDP. Uh, if you keep growing at 78%, you don't have to make an extra effort uh, to spend more on defense. Uh, China with barely 2% of its GDP, I don't know the numbers, a lot of contestation on that. But today is the second largest spender on defense. Uh, India, with $2 trillion GDP, less than 2% spending on defense, has already become the eighth largest spender on defense. So it's going to happen in any case. So, so you have three explanations you can pick uh, what you want. Uh, the, on the question of the middle power coalition, and I think, look, I mean, there is a reason for pessimism, but I don't think territorial disputes are the issue. India Japan have no territorial disputes. In fact, uh, we're at the two ends of China. But what binds us probably is less than, more than what, what divides us. Uh, in fact, as I said, it's part of a national movement also for what with the Japanese. We were blessed with two armies, one fought with the British, another fought with the Japs. Uh, so, uh, and Singapore was blessed with both of them, so both of them showed up here. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the, the question is, for us, I think the, the issue is, there will be collective action problems, but is there something we can do? But if you say, look, given the collective action problem, I'm not going to do anything. But that's not the way politics works. That look, you work, do what you can with the Japanese and Australians. You keep the Americans and the Chinese out of the room. That is a very critical condition. That you've got to keep both of them out of the room to create a insurance against their policies, both their respective policies as well as their joint policies. So, so therefore, I think there is huge room for such collaboration. And we've seen in the last five years, when there was a count that was made more than 70 to 80 new defense cooperation agreements have been signed by Asian powers between themselves. Vietnam alone has signed over 20 war. India has signed over 25 war. Everyone is saying, look, you can't be sure. Let's do more defense collaboration. So I think it is at infancy. But if you say three, four major countries, like India, Australia, Japan, that would be one. India, Vietnam, Japan. I mean, there are countries which actually can do a lot together interoperability, sharing intelligence, maritime domain awareness, you name it. I mean, there are a whole lot of small things that can be done, which will eventually, there's a pool. I mean, we can create another pool as well, not just the China-Japan pool, but the rest of Asia can also create a pool of small drops, which provide some insurance against uh, uncertainty in the US-China. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you asked me to put on my Philippine hat. I don't have a Philippine hat. In fact, I knew about President Aquino's presence in Singapore only because my colleague who's seated over there told me, but I didn't know. So what, so this is an indication of the fact that I don't get consulted at all. <laughs> and this includes ASEAN as a talk shop. The gentleman referred to ASEAN as a talk shop. Well, the question to address to him is, what's wrong with talking? The other thing, what, what can ASEAN do? The other thing is, ASEAN has been very poor in projecting what it does. And it does plenty in things that count for the people. Only it is not known by most people who are not affect, directly affected by, by what it does. So, as for the attitude of Indonesians, Vietnamese, Filipinos towards 
presence of the U.S. I think that whatever the motive is, China's actions aroused in a lot of these people a fear of China arising from what the Japanese did during the Pacific War. And here I think China could have softened its positions. As it is, the, the alliance with the U.S. became fashionable again because of what China did and does. And here we have to think of how to mitigate the situation rather than allowing, say, the more hawkish elements in China to dictate Chinese foreign policy. Well, first of all, I'm going to add from, from, from the chair. Uh, I think conceptually this is an interesting thing to talk about. By that I mean, in reality, uh, there is no chance. Uh, but but uh, I think when uh, uh, Zhu Fan said uh, in the morning, China would be, well, there, there is a scenario where China would be able to accept the nuclear deal. And one very critical assumption of that is US out, right? So, so you, you want US out. And you want to live with Japan happily. And uh, that Japan even uh, includes a scenario of Japan will live there. So that's a very interesting scenario. And, uh, and a very interesting concept. And but, but as I said, in reality, uh, Japan going nuclear, I mean, there are tons of reasons why Japan wouldn't. Yeah, I don't want to mention them. I need time until tomorrow morning. And uh, tons of reasons why Japan would go nuclear. So, so Japan going nuclear, talking about this as a realistic scenario, that's silly, totally absurd. Doesn't help anything. Uh, I mean, uh, let alone actual policy and uh, for foreign countries, Japan policy. Uh, but maybe conceptually, this could be an interesting kind of subject to talk about. Well, uh, uh, three points raised by a Korean friend. Uh, first one is perhaps somebody else, uh, because I didn't talk about territory ambition of China. I, I talked about a totally different con context in which territorial disputes uh, should be uh, placed. Uh, but as to the second and third, uh, <coughs> I, think, I think the logic is, is the other way around. Uh, China, I think China has in fact talked about South China Sea Island as uh, a foreign interest uh, some time ago. Uh, and Chinese interest in South China Sea Islands dates back to at least to the 1970s. China took parcels from the Vietnamese in the 70s, and then, then the 80s as well. And in, in, in the early 90s, uh, the mischief uh, reefs from the Philippines. So they actually took those islands. Uh, you know, this is, so so Ch Chinese interest in this and the, the de definition of these islands as being very critical for China. I think is very deep rooted and it's a long history compared to the attitude towards Senkaku, for instance. Uh, so in a way, China upgraded the, the meaning of Senkaku uh, at the same level of uh, South China Sea from our point of view because they, their approaches to the islands were totally different until 2008 or 2010, around that time. But they redefined this issue. And the redefinition, to me, very much resembles how they approached the South China Sea for many years. And, and I grouped South China Sea and the East China Sea islands in, in the single category, again, in a very macro picture where I just, in my presentation, talked about implications of political disputes for uh, shifting international order, regional order, at the time of the rise of China. Uh, and, uh, and about middle power cooperation, uh, Again, uh, please uh, pay attention to what I said uh, when I introduced this uh, uh, subject, which is I talked about the long-term nature of uh, challenges coming from 
by description of um, you know, stretch. And it, it's a long term thing. And uh, short term, of course, um, uh, difficulties, of course, um, uh, are there. And, uh, but but, but uh, I, I'm not personally interested in talking about those difficulties because I believe in the importance of this kind of, kind of new thinking by taking long term perspective. But, but even if uh, that's the case, uh, I see some, some cases where de facto mineral power security cooperation have actually been happening, even between Japan and South Korea. Uh, toward the end of the Inyoma government, Tokyo and Seoul agreed to GSOMIA, first of all, General Security of Inf Military Information Act, and AXA, Acquisition and Cross-Servicing Agreement, uh, which is the formula, legal formula between the two militaries to work together in typical non-conventional security uh, you know, issues, such as UNPKO, you know, disaster relief, and human security. And Japan and South Korea almost came to, to the completion of that negotiation. So document is there. Uh, and that itself, I think, is a kind of de facto middle power cooperation uh, evolving between Japan and South Korea. And Australia and Japan actually signed AXA in 2010. And so that's the first AXA which Japan signed with the uh, you know, foreign country, uh, except the United States. But of course, Japan and Australia, AXA is again all about non-traditional, typical middle power security cooperation. No element of traditional security cooperation. And, uh, so, and Korea and Australia have similar comprehensive security agreement. Uh, and uh, so trilateralizing Japan, Korea, Australia, non-traditional security cooperation, I think, theoretically possible, and seas are there already. But of course, political will is not there, and our psychology does not pay attention to that sort of actual you know, development of very critical things actually happening in reality. So, so long term, uh, well, I, I'm older than I look, so I don't have much future left, but uh, my academic sense of mission is to continue to work on this theme, and build cooperation with South Korea. South Korea is very important in this, you know, kind of conceptualization of Japan's new regional engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, the part that Professor Soya referred to um, on <coughs> Japan's uh, nuclear weapons, it was really music to my ears. Uh, I happen to have a paper trail of publications on why Japan will not go nuclear, but I've had uh, a lot of resistance from my neo-realist colleagues in, in the U.S. that have been predicting uh, Japan's nuclearization for the last 30 or 40 years, just like uh, economists sometimes predict uh, nine of the last four recessions. Uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, I agree with you um, um, that there are so many reasons that overwhelm uh, the, the, the near really scenario for Japan. Uh, Ted's question on does the US have the political will for another Cold War? Or is the coast clear for China's rights? As if these are the only two options. There are many, many more options, I think. But, but it's interesting because um, in um, there is a meeting of the International Studies Association um, the, next, the upcoming meeting, the 2015 meeting of the ISA, the International Studies Association in New Orleans will, will feature a panel on the world, uh, what, what the world will look like when the U.S. is no longer out there. So, uh, you know, assuming the total absence of the U.S. Uh, in the international arena. Uh, so I don't want to go that far, but I don't think there's a stomach for, for another Cold War, and there are many efforts going on. Uh, and I believe you know, President Obama is, is part of those efforts to avoid a Cold War. Uh, many Americans have uh, very little stomach for engaging in uh, international adventures that basically uh, end up that, you know, the U.S. is dumb if you do and dumb if you don't, anyways. Uh, and that fuels a lot of skepticism about what the U.S. should or shouldn't do 
out there. Now this is different from isolationism. Uh, I think isolation is a non-starter. But I think that what the world will look like going forward, going forward very much depends on who holds the reins of power in all of the countries, all the major countries involved uh, in this part of the world and, and, as, uh, and elsewhere. And the way I see them, these are the forces that benefit from what has happened so far in recent decades, you know, the kinds of things that ASEAN, AFTA, you know, all this, uh, the internationalization of the economies that really led to the kinds of sentiments in China that uh, Professor uh, Zupeng uh, described that I think are very common in all countries in Asia and, and the US, right? Those, those constituencies in countries that have benefited from the internationalization of not just the economy but the polity as well uh, will probably, and there is actually another set of polls, not that I'm a big believer in polls, but there's another set of, of, of polls on how many people in the Asia Pacific uh, see trade and exchange as beneficial. An overwhelming majority does. Uh, so this is not just about big business and, and big interests, it's about consumers and so on that benefit from these things. Whether those will be the constituencies that uh, hold the reins, uh, as I think they do in, in China and uh, even Japan, uh, uh, and uh, for the most part, except North Korea in this part of the world, or instead uh, they would be overwhelmed by the competing, the competing fa faction that tends to be uh, very much inward looking, nationalistic, a lot of military, military um, industrial sectors involved in that because they benefit from that kind of order that is not cooperative. Um, and so um, I think that uh, that's where uh, the balance of uh, conflict and cooperation in this part of the world uh, will, will lie. I was going, I wanted to address on this very point by extending it to, I don't think Professor Bruma is with us anymore, is he done? Well, but he did, he did mention the analogy with, with uh, or maybe I will wait until he comes back. <laughs> Yeah, let me just respond very briefly. First of all, uh, uh, let me outline a couple of the uh, liabilities behind my assumption. Japan um, might better uh, go nuclear. First is, I think that Japan goes nuclear and well, just to solidify Japan's sense of uh, security. So provide help for Japan uh, to think it can completely survive the current type of the Chinese power. So then, I, I think it's not joking. It's a, some sort of, we say, uh, uh, asymmetrical psychology probably now is hindering the both relationship. Uh, if the, the psychology will be getting uh, more uh, balanced, that will be helpful. The second we will see, uh, for example, if Japan goes nuclear, then probably we can, both sides will be better positioned to use the Cold War experience to build let's say some sort of uh, 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 great rivalry uh, management relationship. So that will be uh, probably creating some sort of uh, a lingering base to underscore the stability. And of course, the last one, you probably also will uh, make the Japan factors probably is also more balanced, both in economy and in diplomacy and security. For example, so then uh, Japan's regional security activism is always now on the way. That's the problem is we didn't want to see the Abe is always keep the China hammering. We hope that Japan could just uh, gain a little bit more space to welcome China on board. So then the nuclear weapon probably is, is a little bit in a function better. So I'm a, a sincere follower, a sincere believer to uh, Professor Ken Liver Source Theory. So I, I, I like to see such a nuclear stability work. Um, then the second question I want to respond to uh, 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 Professor uh, Salah, Salah Chama. Yeah, so I think, yes, ASEAN may be uh, getting scared about China um, because China do this, do that. But if we examine China's actions in 
some sort of ASEAN uh, or South China Sea uh, in a very quantifiable way, viable way. But we'll see China now is more restrained than the 80s and even most of the 90s. I'm serious. So if we go back to the 80s, we're using military coercion. We're kicking the Vietnamese ace. We're, we're robbing the islands and the islands back. Then back to 1995, we almost we used, as you know, military coercion vis-a-vis -vis Philippines. But now we do anything like that. I'm very honest. Yes, you can say China is getting more assertive. China is even getting more aggressive. But 20 years ago, and, and 15 years ago, that kind of a China was more, really genuinely more aggressive. But why China seem just uh, uh, doing something less productive in the 80s and the 90s that caused such a big bang, big universe? The reason is China's getting bigger. So it draw a lot of attention. So whatever China do, it always suffer a lot of the, uh, the, the, the criticism. Now, on the other hand, China is in transition. So my theory is China, by and large, is an adolescent power. Don't take China as a virtual power. Almost in all the terms, but China is not. So as I say, China now is learning to be a great power. For example, I also see a lot of very stupid mismatch between China's South China Sea policy and some sort of where it's a one belt, one load, you know, offers. China should learn to be smart. It's very important. But on the other hand, I don't think that China has any calculation to overtake the South China Sea. No way. Now I'm hating a national project, very specific on South China Sea studies. My hunch is very simple. Sooner or later, we should compromise. We should get back to give and take approach. Get this is resolved. Otherwise, South China Sea will be a strategic dogma. That kind of a South China Sea will terminate the China's upper hill and the train to be ascending or rising power. So the last question is, China's soft landing possibility of a ground strategy. So far, I don't think China has any ground strategy. China now, as a whole, is struggling to have a good hold of ground strategy. But unfortunately, China has never been more divided, never been more pluralistic. So what kind of factions will take the lead in fabricating China's ground strategy thinking? So far, it's still too early to say what kind of that ground strategy will lay out. But anyway, my view is that China is a vulnerable power. We shouldn't just focus more on international relations. We should more on China's domestic transformation. So the ground strategy usually is absolute about how to realize your international goals. But now that to be a free rider is based the way China can realize international goals. Can I ask a question? Just push you a little bit further on the on the Japan. Okay. Can I just just a Please. two finger? Okay. Uh, if your scenario of Japan going nuclear were to uh, become true. What would be the situation with uh, South Korea? What would South Korea be tempted to do? Yeah, if the Japan goes nuclear, then a couple of the regional members will be going nuclear either. So then regional security order will be reshuffled. So then my view is that so far we should keep the all options open. My view, because for example, so I understand Soya Sensei's view of the Japan's the middle power, some sort of uh, 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 template. But uh, in my eyes, Japan is a great power. Japan is not a middle power. 
So what kind of the mistake Chinese made in the past 20 years is we always tend to see Japan as a middle power. So now we pay a lot. So should we take uh, two or three more questions and before we wrap things up? Where is the microphone? Oh. And let's see, one, two, three. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Ali, I'm from the uh, Debate Association. Uh, I do have two uh, questions that you know, were just raised by, you know, briefly touched on by Professor Ito as well as Professor Tu. Uh, but before that, um, you know, as a side note, uh, I was also hoping to you know, speak to you guys later about you know, perhaps can I invite you to speak at you know, one of my other events. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll, we'll connect later, right? Um, okay, so two of the issues right, that, I, uh, that I want to talk about. So, um, uh, Professor Tu, you briefly talked about um, you know, how uh, you know, there is a bit more plurality of opinion even within the countries. Um, I do subscribe to the view that people nowadays, they don't necessarily grow up in one particular culture. You have you know, people uh, you know, transit going you know, between countries and you know, learning about other cultures and perhaps identifying more with you know, other political beliefs, political systems, cultures, subcultures, and so on and so forth. So, uh, because of this increasingly globalized nature of you know countries, their populace, uh, their politicians, even, um, you know, the narrative that we're sort of going on sort of paints a picture uh, of a very unitary perspective of what one country believes and what con one country does not. Believe. So I was um, rather than you know focus on the relevance of what one country necessarily believes or does not believe. Uh, do you think that you know we could more talk about how? Uh, Certain groups in, in you know specific countries uh, and you know political groups I'm referring to specifically. Certain political groups have a bit more uh, sway in terms of you know whether or not one country decides to do one thing or another. Something that was also talked about uh, in the earlier speech, right? Which so that can question more quick. Okay, um, I don't dispute that there are historical tensions to re to lead that lead to all these problems today. Uh, however, uh, economic cooperation is quite you know big between China and all the other countries. Right. Um, you want to talk about just you know China between combined of USA, South Korea, and Japan. That's about a third of their like total exports. Um, yeah, I did check the numbers. Um, so you know, although I can see that you know there are some conflicts within the region, to say that you know a, a full blown war will necessarily break out or even a skirmish will break out would put a would put a huge damper on this you know economic you know, interdependence. Um, I don't think that will happen. What do you think? Um, so in an I of the Institute of South Asian Studies here in Singapore, it's a question addressed to Professor Shubhan. So you didn't mention India at all in your presentation. Does India really matter to China? And if so, is that as a potential partner of China or as a potential partner of someone else like Japan and or U.S.? Thank you. And, uh, I think the last question. Thank you all very much. My name is Will. I'm a visiting fellow at RSIS. Uh, two questions very quickly. Uh, one for Professor Zhu. Although I would hesitate to say the U.S. is a mature uh, foreign power or great power, uh, what role do you see the U.S. being able to play in China's rise? Uh, are there certain actions that you would perhaps recommend the U.S. take? And for the middle power uh, panel, so the, the left side here, to, to what extent does U.S. bilateral relations in the region prevent the success of middle powers coming together? I think we've talked about these alliances, but the Philippine alliance comes to mind right off the bat as something very central to U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we have a, an alliance, a non-NATO non treaty alliance with Thailand, which is also very central to U.S. policy, although perhaps somewhat defunct now. But, and, and then very strong bilateral strategic partnerships with all these countries. To what extent does that uh, prevent the, the middle powers from coming together? Thank you. Uh, we have five minutes, so please keep your answers short. Just, uh, I think the... Look, I think the U.S. bilateral relations, I mean, I think any middle power coalition, well, we're not going to say that Japan should dump their lines with the U.S. to be part of the middle power coalition. 
nobody's going to leave the US because US is the most powerful force. And that till it breaks down, you want to hold on to this very important relationship. Uh, similarly, look, so, but yet Japan is looking around for other partners. So there's some hedging by diversifying the relationship. India historically non-aligned uh, and was opposed to alliances. But today we say, look, you've got to engage some with the United States. You've got to do more with the United States. But at the same, same time, you're not sure how the US will eventually uh, play the game. So therefore, you work with countries, US allies, uh, in bilateral, trilateral, sometimes with the US, sometimes not with the US. And at the same time, simultaneously keep engaging the Chinese as well. Uh, so, so I think it is, if we see it as a hedging strategy, that look, you create an alternative by working with others and not treating this as an exclusive thing that you only got to do this. So I think what it does is such a network cooperation would provide the basis for uh, wider engagement and create some options over the longer term. Philippines, for example, you mentioned. Uh, today is signing up agreements with any, anybody who's willing to stand up to them and say, look, we can give you two more fast track roads and we can work with you and deal with the Chinese. It could be diplomatic, it could be political, it could be military. Uh, I think there was one other question which you meant, you know, on the stick of books. Look, like the, all the great trading powers who came to the Indian Ocean, started the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, the Americans, you know, French in between. Now, I think the Chinese are going to be in the Indian Ocean. So I don't think we should construct it as an anti-Indian thing. That look, only the difference is they all came from the West, these guys are coming from the East. Uh, if the second largest economy, the world's largest trading power, they will, they're bound to be in the Indian Ocean. Now the question is the nature of the presence is what matters, not that they're coming. In the short term, I don't see a threat from the Chinese because they, anything they construct will be very vulnerable. Uh, Indian Navy can bomb, uh, Indian Air Force can bomb what they do in Sri Lanka. So I think that's not the issue today. The question is, what is there going to be a long-term military presence? In the short term, I think India is going to work, try to consolidate its own position, work with Japan, work with the US, but at the same time also engage the Chinese, saying that what is it that we can do? We can construct a maritime dialogue so that we can do more things together, we can understand some things together. And there are areas like maritime safe where India would be interested in working with both Japan and China and the United States if they're willing to help. So I just want to conclude with one thought. I think. Going back to the 50s, you know, Nehru, immediately after the Second World War, they said two very important things. China can't be isolated. The Americans might say China, PRC doesn't exist, but China exists. So therefore, you've got to deal with the reality of the China that exists, and the Chinese nationalism will eventually prevail over Chinese communism. In some senses, you've got the basic argument right, but of course, you underestimated Chinese power, when you got into other problems. The second important thing he said was that, look, Japan cannot be isolated that alone among uh, this region said that, look, Japan, whatever happened in the Second World War, after the war, you cannot construct a stable Asia by excluding the Japanese from it. And you mentioned the Tokyo trials, there was an Indian judge, because who called it the victor's justice, rather than Opal, that the Indians were not willing to treat Japan as a black, black, whatever. Uh, that, you know, that, that, in fact, a large number of the Southeast Asians as well do not see Japan in the manner that Northeast Asia looks at Japan. After all, many national movements here saw the Japanese as partners in countering the European colonial powers. So it is not such a neat, simple division, Japanese were bad, the Chinese were good. Of course, we strongly supported the Japanese uh, in Chinese movements against Japan, Japan's occupation. But if you want a stable Asia, you've got to see both China and Japan playing the role. And without that, you cannot construct uh, any structure that will that will endure, and that I think is a challenge. So I would see the territorial disputes not as a fight over islands, but it is a contestation of the nature of the order that you're going to build. Is Chinese power going to be benign or hegemonic? But are the Japanese defense of these islands is it about merely protecting the territory or finding defenses against the Chinese and trying to get in power? So, so I think a sino Japanese rapprochement will be critical. And I think the U.S. as a major power in the will also have to play a role. But I think putting it in a Northeast Asian perspective on China, Japan, and history is not everyone's perspective in Asia. If I may, uh, yeah, thank, thank you for the question. I think that's, that's very important, and the role of the U.S., particularly in connection to, I think, one of the points raised by again, a Korean friend, uh, middle powers being all, uh, all being from U.S. And that, uh, I, uh, yeah. Roger and India is not 
uh, Southeast Asia Summit. Uh, I'm the honest, by the United States. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, well, unless uh, Raja Mohan talked about middle power, I, I was somewhat determined that I'm not going to raise this answer. But I would have said the same thing without using that term middle power, because this is more confusing than clarifying and regarding many things. But, but anyway, uh, I think my concept of East Asian country cooperation, which is equal to middle power cooperation conceptually, is uh, you know this has no elements of balance of power or power, power politics, and you know we cannot deal with China in, in the domain of traditional you know, power politics, even if we can. And uh, the same is true vis-à-vis -vis the United States. So conceptually, again, conceptually, this concept is neutral between U.S. and China. But in reality, yeah. of course, we do need the U.S. in the following two, two senses. One is, uh, as I said, the uh, immediate and the midterm goal of middle power cooperation or East Asia cooperation is survival and at the time of the rise of China. And, but in order for us to, to survive through our cooperation, we need the U.S. as an anchor. Without that, and this would mean not much. You know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, but over the long run, I, I said coexistence. You know, uh, so for us to coexist with China, U.S.-China relationship should, should be in good shape in one way or another. If they continue to you know, engage in strategic rivalry, for us to coexist with China is not going to happen. So, so, so the the role of U.S., the meaning of the U.S. role in the region could be somewhat different. Uh, uh, you know, on, on these two phases. Uh, processes, and uh, but of course it, it is very critical. It is very critical, and the sino the sino us relationship is very critical. Like Professor Suya, I agree totally with my friend Raja Mohan. However, I would like to add one more consideration, and it is that bilateral relations with anyone, whether with the U.S., with China, with Japan, with India, are critical in other relations. That's, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Maybe, uh, if I can go ahead. Like, yeah. And Joe will wrap it up. Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, well, you know, the, over the entire afternoon, the issue of whether or not East Asia today resembles pre-World War I Europe. Uh, the issue has come up, and it, it has come up more generally around the world, the comparative analogy between pre-World War I Europe and, uh, or 1914 and 2014. And I want to um, reassure you know, our audience, I do think that analogy is way overstretched. There's some components that were mentioned uh, in Professor Bruman's uh, talk earlier. But there's a huge difference between pre-World War I Germany, the Kaiserreich, and China today. Huge. I'm vested in this article that just appeared on uh, describing why the differences are uh, enormous. To begin with, and just to leave you with one flavor, the um, nature of the um, Kaiserreich, the pre-World War I Germany in 1914 was that of an inward-looking protectionist uh, regime. Uh, financially very precarious, very few people uh, know this, and uh, completely deriving its resources from protectionism. It was sort of a, a, a legacy of the Iron Right Coalition uh, in Germany that developed uh, since the 1880s uh, onwards. China today relies on the global economy for its own survival and enables it to uh, derive enormous benefits with which it can compensate its population for a number of uh, uh, reasons. And uh, it, it has cast its, its um, um, wherewithal in the global economy, and that is a, that's a tremendous difference. To add to that, the region within which China is embedded today, East Asia, 
likewise is a region of internationalizing economies. This is a very different world, very different world than the world of 1914. Okay, okay so uh, very briefly, uh, first of all, I can't tell you guys uh, uh, more about some sort of such a, a misgiving of historical uh, analogy uh, between today's China-Japan relations and the uh, First World War. I just want to add one thing. So then, um, for example, so in the country of the century, so what matters for both countries? I don't think we still just are always mild in some sort of such a national hatred and some sort of, we say, uh, very uh, sophisticated national calculation uh, in the military terms. There's a very ironical you know, the case I can share with you, for example, now that our relations is really getting very bad, it's even worse. Uh, first half of this year, the, the, the number of the Chinese tourists to visit Japan doubled. What does it mean? I mean, we still cherish a very good feeling to each visit. So then uh, the people couldn't just uh, how say, identify how, you know, the, 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 the bad there, you know, uh, official relation is. The people is always recognize what kind of things that they like to come after. So Japan is a big shopping market. Japan is a good scenic you know, place. Japan's onsen is very welcome. But they go there. I think that's a truly peace element between the two countries. And the question is, is, is America's role? I found it's very interesting. For example, if we get back to 1992, the professor uh, Harry Hadden um, published his book vividly describing the Washington Bay relations as a hate and a love. Then in the, in the, in the past half year, we did a, uh, some sort of new research work to see how much hate, how much love just remain among the Chinese. I have to say there's no big change 20 years later. So our relations remain very, very hate and love. But the problem is when I see the, 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 the name of a favorable feeling for the U.S. among the Chinese, is not just a gold flag, but also just a little bit hiking. So then, um, my view is that what kind of role the China really expect the U.S. to play? The first thing is, I hope the U.S. continue to be a very delicate balance between the Chinese and the Japanese. And now, in the past one and a half year, I see the U.S. remain served as the balance area, but delicacy is gone. That gets the Chinese very irritated. I have to say that. The second, we also hope the U.S. could pay more attention to some sort of better for the people. But the problem is America is highly commissioned to some sort of uh, uh, value diplomacy. Then I may say value diplomacy. Also, I will now say value diplomacy. That really, really, very, very bad mood killer. We should recognize where such a very inflammatory policy could be. Because it's useless. China is a very peculiar reality. 1.4 billion people. How can they then? fully and very significantly democratized. I think it's a, a very formidable task force. Then, last one. U.S. is a very illuminating beacon to the China's future. So I hope U.S. could also play some sort of uh, uh, not soft power. I also could just uh, as they're getting uh, into some sort of uh, smart diplomacy still illuminating the China's past take. Then last question. Um, yeah, India. Um, I think the India factor is always dismaying the Chinese expert like me. <laughs> the reason is, um, I think we don't think the India is a threat to Chinese. The reason is very simple. Because of Himalaya sitting in between. It's the tallest mountain. It's not a fighting battlefield. So look at our relations in the past 2,000 years. We just fought a single war in 1962. 
So then, um, that's the promise I know for them in 1962's war, wounds remain unhealed, healable. Then on the other hand, China's long-term back in behind the East Lanadai is really getting the Indians very, very nervous. But uh, my view is that even the unresolved border issue, then, well, just a re, you know, inflict some sort of a theater war, no. Then the East Lanadai issues will get to the China also become some sort of a big harmful factor to India, no. Then the third one is um, China and India were competing on the uh, maritime sphere only influence in India Ocean, no. So my view is that China and India relations is more about perception, less about some sort of real material rise, uh, 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 such a, a contestation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I think I can probably um, share everyone's time here and say we learned a hell of a lot from our panelists uh, this afternoon and also from Ian Peruma earlier. So uh, let's thank uh, both the departments of political science and Japanese studies and Ian Peruma for coming and our panelists up here and you, the audience. Thank you.